today we have the visit of Professor Parta Lahiri uh, from the University of Maryland, uh, College Park, USA. Uh, Professor Lahiri is a well-known researcher in the area of smaller estimation, uh, survey sampling, uh, inference in finite populations, and many other topics, uh, statistics. And we have the privilege of receiving him uh, today and hearing mm -hmm. this uh, nice talk that uh, he will deliver in our research center. So, thank you, Sparta. Okay. Thank you, Domingo, uh, for your introduction and thank you for inviting me in this country, nice city. You know, I'm really enjoying it. Uh, compared to what we heard in the morning, mine is a very simple one. <laughs> and I'm sure you have a lot of patience. Uh, so essentially, I took a uh, very traditional area level model introduced by Pay and Harriet, and I tried to investigate uh, some theoretical properties of some of the estimation procedure that we normally face uh, in the context of a Hayek model. So, and we, we felt that it would be easier uh, to do the work uh, for a rather simple, univariate traditional Hayek model. Okay, but uh, it would be interesting to kind of see whether uh, the the theory and method that I'm going to describe uh, will extend to some of the more complex situation that you have been doing. It will be really interesting. And uh, this work, uh, this talk is based on my uh, collaborative work with my former uh, PhD student, Masayo Hirose, who came from Japan to work with me and uh, if you're interested in the details, uh, you can uh, look at this. Oh, I cannot do that again. This Hirose and Lahiri paper, 2018 in Annals of Statistics, that has got all the, all the details. Okay, so here is the outline of my talk. Uh, so I'll... Uh, describe small area estimation in the context of area level model only. I know there are many, many different models uh, in the small area, and each has some advantages and disadvantages, but I'll just stay with the area level model. And then uh, given a model, we know there are various approaches of making inference. Um, and for this talk, I'll stay with the empirical best linear prediction. That doesn't mean other approaches are not useful. Uh, and uh, specifically, I'll be talking about a new variance component estimation uh, method for achieving certain desirable properties that I will explain as I go along. And we have some Monte Carlo simulation study, and we have a, a real data analysis uh, using the SAPI data. This is one of the ones most well-known uh, small area uh, program in a government setting. It's called Small Area Income and Poverty Estimates Program of the U.S. Census Bureau. And then we have some final conclusion. Uh, I spend a lot of time on uh, this page, but uh, for you, it's all known. <laughs> so I don't have to talk much. But basically, I'd like to say uh, estimation of uh, big population is always of interest to any given country. We want to know what's the unemployment rate, what's the poverty rate, what's the per capita income at the country level. But it is also important to understand what's happening for various subgroups. And the subgroups can be geographical areas, like, for example, municipalities, you know, province. Uh, or it could be uh, demographics, like age and sex, or it could be a combination of these. So basically, uh, there is a lot of interest in understanding uh, what's happening at various 
is aggregated level. In fact, uh, this data is very, very important because of this United Nations uh, Sustainable Development Goal. They specifically said it's not just the uh, big area level uh, socioeconomic data or health or education, but we also need to know various disaggregate level because uh, if you know disaggregate level statistics, uh, you have an opportunity to take some action. Uh, maybe give some more support to some specific disaggregated group so that uh, we can elevate, say, property or some other uh, topics of interest. So uh, this is uh, well known direct method. That means you use uh, the uh, observation that's available only for that specific area. And area is a generic term. It can be geographical area or demographic. Uh, and for the time of interest, if you consider that specific data, a uh, lot of times it's not adequate to produce a reliable estimate. When you say reliable estimate, it means that you may be able to produce something, but it would be highly precise in terms of variance. And sometimes you cannot even produce the direct estimate because there is no data. Okay. Uh, now, uh, so we we talked about that. And, uh, we will be talking about area level model, and specifically the fair model in this talk. But I would like to say there, there are also unit level model. Uh, unit level me model means that you have observation at the very fine level, like person level or household level or farm level, whatever be your ultimate unit. Um, so there are models like that, and there are aggregate level models. So uh, in a generic way, it means that you don't model the observation in the finest unit, but you model at some aggregates, you know, usually uh, some direct estimates. Now, uh, there are advantages and disadvantages for this, uh, these two different types of models. But area level models is getting popular for a couple of reasons. One is that uh, a lot of times uh, there is a concern about um, confidentiality of data, you know, and uh, for that reason it may be difficult to get the image level observation. And so the second point is related to that. It, a lot of times it's easier to get aggregate level data than the image level data. You have to sign some special agreement with the government agency, right? And a lot of times you can get these aggregate statistics from some public information. So you can play with it. Especially it's important for those of us who work in academic setting may not have access to the very fine level of uh, data. So this is the Fahenic model, all of you know. I basically, uh, Fay and Harriet, in 1979, they published a paper in Journal of American Statistical Association. That's the highest cited uh, paper in uh, small area estimation. And their problem is they were trying to estimate per capita income of small places, places with population size, uh, even 100 or less, you know, they're trying to estimate that um, using some survey, uh, sample survey data, which is actually not small sample because that's like, a, uh, that's based on like what they call long form of the decennial census. That's a huge sample, like uh, 60 to 70 million people. But when you go to a small community in the US, you have a small area problem. Even with this big uh, sample size. Uh, because in that long form, they have income related information that they have to use. And so they recognized this problem long back in the 70s 
and they uh, developed this model. They basically, uh, what they did uh, in this slide, you have the Y, which is the direct estimate of per capita income for their cases. And I is the areas they are combining information from, and which are the small places, small places. And M is the number of small area you want to pull. Obviously, you have to be careful about how many areas and which areas to pull, but that, those are the detailed questions. Um, and then uh, they, in their original paper, uh, they actually used a, a law of transformation of per capita income. There was a reason for that because they were concerned about the estimation of sampling variance of the direct estimate and they recognized it would be very unstable and so this log transformation is a part of the smoothing process i'm not going to get into the detail because it will take some time but it is uh, there in their paper and uh, and then theta i is the uh, true part of theta income actually it's a transform version of that uh, and x is at the auxiliary variables that are available at the area area and uh, for them they got this auxiliary variable from the tax department for example housing prices of the small area and things like that and then di di is the uh, some kind of smooth variance estimate okay and beta is the regression coefficient and a is the model variance now one can uh, view this as a two level model which is a particular case of multi level model or hierarchical model uh, phi and area they call it a bayesian model where level 1 is the sampling distribution level 2 is the prior distribution you can also uh, view this as a, a linear mixed model, a very special case of linear mixed model. And for this talk, we are going to just take the identity transformation of this. So that means you are modeling directly on the direct estimate. And so this is exactly what I said. It's a particular case of a linear mixed model. So here, the x beta part is the fixed component. Uh, U is the random component and E is the, the sampling error. So uh, basically what U, the random effect does, it uh, tries to capture the variability not captured by the area specific auxiliary variable because we cannot be perfect, right? So there will be always a variation because we cannot say the true value theta is equal to the right? There will be some error, and this error is captured by U, the uh, random effects part of it. Okay, so uh, um, at the outset, I would like to make it clear that D, the sampling variances, they are all known, but in reality, they are estimated. And so when you go for area level model, one of the drawback of the area level model you won't be able to capture the variability in estimating the sampling variance because you don't have that information, right? And so that's the one. And this is the, uh, the question is when you have the failure model, how do you um, estimate the true small area means in this case thetas, right? Well, there are many approaches and uh, the one that I'm going to talk about here is the, the best linear unbiased prediction predictor for plot of the time. What is that? Uh, basically, we are interested in estimating the theta i, the mixed effect, right? Theta i is equal to xi prime beta plus the area specific random effects u i. We are to estimate that. Well, if we say theta i hat is an estimator, an estimator of that, or the predictor of that, because in the classical context, theta is a mixed effect, so theta i has, we can call predictor. So if you look at uh, the mean square error, some people call it mean square prediction error, the same thing. 
is basically the uh, average uh, squared deviation from the true value uh, where the expectation or the average taken over the fixed effect mod, uh, the failure model, the linear mix model. When you do this operation, that means, uh, and you restrict yourself to all the unbiased predictors, then you get a nice formula. And uh, you, uh, most of you know this formula. It's a very nice formula, which is a weighted uh, average of the direct estimate yi and uh, the regression uh, synthetic estimator xi prime beta hat. Uh, uh, sorry. It should be, let's see, uh, uh, I'm sorry, th there should not be any beta hat here. It should come next when you talk about uh, empirical base predictor. So without a beta hat here, it's the base predictor. But then uh, you don't know um, the, uh, no, I think I'm okay. Right. Yeah, I'm okay, well, I'm okay, right. sorry, yeah. So the, this is the best linear bus predictor, but A is a, A is more, okay? So this is correct. And, um, but the question is, uh, what to do uh, in the next step? Because we do not know uh, the variance component A, right? Uh, the nice thing about the formula, as uh, you probably know that the shrinkage factor BI, that the weight that you give to the regression synthetic um, has a very nice formula, which is sampling variance di over the total value, a plus di. So what will happen if uh, the di or the sampling variance of the direct estimator is very large compared to the model variance a, then most of the weight will go to the synthetic part, that is regression synthetic part, and very little to the DA. On the other hand, when the DI is very small, that means your direct estimate is very good, uh, most of the weight will go to the direct estimate uh, and uh, less to the synthetic part. Okay? Now, as I said, we assume here A is known, right? But in practice, A is unknown. That creates problem. And in, in statistics, whenever something is unknown, put a hat there, that is, we have to estimate it, right? So here, A is unknown, and so we need to estimate it, and there are a number of different ways of estimating the model variance, also known as variance component, in, uh, in this uh, pioneering work by Prasad and Rao in 1990, JASA, they propose a method of moments estimator. We usually call it PR estimator, Prasad Rao estimator. And then actually in original paper by Fay and Hellier, they also had an estimator, okay? Which is, you can view this as a, a method of estimate equation and uh, it's uh, commonly referred to as uh, Fay Hellier estimator. And then there are methods uh, like maximum likelihood estimator or female estimator, remail estimator. Uh, there are a number of methods there. So the idea is you take the block and replace A by A hat, where A hat is one of these. You know? And when you do that, it's called E plus, estimated. Okay. In this context, I would like to. Uh, just a little bit about Bayesian. Uh, if uh, you do a purely Bayesian analysis, what you will do, you take the Bayesian model that the uh, Fay and Perry proposed. Now, level one, level two, right? You find the base estimator, which is the posterior distribution, uh, posterior mean of the guy, and under normal normal setting, you can get a close form formula, right? And uh, that would be identical to the best predictor uh, in the classical prediction framework when both beta and A are known. And now, interestingly, you can also motivate block based linear unbiased predictor in a Bayesian. Then what you do, you add one level of hierarchy 
you put, uh, you, you assume that the beta, the regression coefficient, uh, has a flat distribution, okay, in the uh, three-dimensional space. And when you do this, uh, find this posterior distribution of theta given uh, the data and A, A known, and if you look at the uh, mean of that, it turns out to be the best, uh, best linear inverse predictor. So everything matches. Now, the difference will come in when A, the variance component is also unknown. And in, in this e plus approach, okay, which maybe you can also call empirical base approach because you take empirical base and plug in the uh, estimate of what is called high parameter, it turns out to be empirical base. So empirical base and empirical plug will give you the same thing under this uh, uh, paper model. And I simply call it EB instead of E-block because it refers to empirical base or you can also say the plug. So EB is the way. But then uh, if you go fully Bayesian, what you need to do, you need to put a prior on A. And a lot of times people put a flat prior on A as well from zero to infinity. And then you find the posterior distribution. Then you don't have any more parameter, and you take uh, that posterior distribution for making all kinds of interest. In particular, for the uh, estimation problem, we take the posterior mean, which is now one-dimensional integral. But in an EB approach, you, you use some classical method like one of these methods. You plug it in. Um, you don't put any prior on either beta or a. So that's the difference. One one thing uh, about the empirical, uh, I mean hierarchical based approach is that the measure of uncertainty is actually the posterior variance or square root of that, and you don't have to do any analytical calculation. As long as you have the posterior distribution, you can get. But for classical approach, you have to do some hard work. Okay. So now with this uh, very brief introduction, uh, given the difference between base and the empirical base or empirical bluff, I will now introduce some of the methods uh, of estimation of A. Uh, one uh, is the likelihood-based method. And there is this profile maximum likelihood estimator. Uh, it gives basically maximum likelihood estimator. Uh, you take the likelihood, under the Fahariot model, and I have given in the uh, uh, profile likelihood, and you maximize it with respect to A, and uh, what you get is uh, ML, okay? And uh, the residual likelihood, you account for the fact that you have estimated beta, and uh, there is a huge literature on uh, uh, RML for linear mixed model, you know, in, Get the residual likelihood that account for the estimation of beta, and then you maximize it. You know, you get a Riemann estimator. Okay, so there is a factor that I have written H R E that comes in. That's an extra factor that you uh, have to multiply. You know, for the estimation of uh, beta part of it, to account for that thing. Now, one remark that we have in uh, both the methods. They are all available now in the software, uh, so we can get it at, for the linear mixed model and so in particular fairly model. Now, one problem of this method is that for a given data set, uh, you, you may end up getting the estimate of the variance component A on the boundary, that is at zero. When, when that happens, look uh, at the formula here. You look at the shrinkage factor bi hat. When a hat equal to zero, bi hat equal to one. And all the weight goes to the regression sensitivity. And you don't give any weight to the director. And it's the, it's the well-known over shrinkage problem, okay? And so, which, which may not sound good uh, to some area, where they indeed collect a lot of data, right? Maybe one big province or one big 
municipality where you have plenty of data and yet you are saying your estimate is based on purely on level two assumption and nothing uh, coming from the direct uh, sample survey data. Although you estimate beta where you use both uh, the uh, outcome variable and x, but other than that, the, the y, the direct estimate is not coming in there. And so this is the uh, overshoot that's problem. And, uh, and so uh, this is something uh, prompted the census group in the US. They were actually using favorite kind of model, you know, with some modification, and they were using them. And uh, in some of their of the year they tried, it was okay, everything is fine. But in some years, uh, they encountered problem of uh, getting zero estimate for the data sample. And they didn't like it because, you know, if you look at the state level estimation, and in the US, you know, states like California is very big, a lot of samples like Texas, bigger than some of the countries, you know. And so, uh, if you don't give any way to the data, that's not very reasonable. And so, at that point, I was telling you earlier that they needed some solution for this problem. So, what they did basically, they put a prior on A, uh, like flat, flat prior, and gave the estimate of A as a posterior mean of A under the prior, and then you can never get a zero estimate, right? And so once they get the uh, posterior mean of A, you plug it in, in the uh, block, you get your new block. So it's like a hybrid kind of thing. Uh, method. And then eventually they went for fully Bayesian method where they would put uh, priors on beta, priors on A, and do all the analysis based on the posterior distribution, final posterior distribution. So at that time, uh, I was thinking of uh, whether there could be a solution from a classical prediction viewpoint. And that motivated me to think about alternative method, classical method, I'm not talking based on that, classical method where you don't put any prior on the hyperparameter. And so I was thinking how to do it. I didn't have a good uh, idea, but then I read a paper by Morris, Carl Morris and their uh, and his student. And he was not doing any classical method. He was not doing that. Uh, his problem is quite different. His problem is like, uh, he, he would go for Bayesian, completely Bayesian. But what he was trying to do, he was trying to say, whether uh, they could, you know, replace the Monte Carlo Markov chain by a closed form solution. And uh, he called it adjustment for density maximization problem uh, method. And, and so basically, uh, they were uh, approximating a complex uh, posterior distribution by a simple uh, posterior distribution like uh, normal distribution or beta distribution or gamma distribution, we carefully calculated mean and variance of this thing. So I was reading that and in the middle I saw, uh, they said, well, basically they are saying that in order to approximate it, uh, if we try the regular Laplace method, which will approximate the density by normal distribution, they didn't like that. They said, okay, if you have polynomial beta problem, and you think that the posterior is uh, not symmetric, why not approximate the beta distribution? Likewise, for Poisson gamma problem, they will approximate the gamma distribution. So that's one part of the problem. And the second problem is we know that in Laplace met method, when uh, you have the boundary problem, then it doesn't work very well. So they wanted to make sure that the the, the mode uh, is bounded away from uh, zero, I mean, the balance problem. And there they use the technique, uh, which I found quite interesting. I thought, okay, maybe we could use it in a classical framework because there is nothing Bayesian to it, you know. Uh, and so we, we use that technique 
and then you know in some private conversation with Carl Morris, I said I used your method at polygon eighty. I said no, no, that's not my method. <laughs> so I, I changed it to adjusted maximum likelihood. And because I was looking at more from a classical prediction point of view and studying the asymptotic properties and things like that. So what we did basically, uh, I mean, there are formulas, but don't worry about all these things. Uh, so you have this, say, linear like right? You can do it for a profile like you as well. So you take linear like right? And for some particular data, uh, you might get zero state. So the question is why? Because of the uh, form of the lightning. So here you have a function of A, right? And so if uh, the function is such that it's like monotonically decreasing here, and the maximum will be attained at zero. So if you can somehow twist this or adjust this likelihood, you probably okay. So, um, so what we did, we multiply the likelihood by a factor, uh, the, which is same as the Bayesian component. So this is basically this is the straight line. And so when you take this multiply, it will be slightly bent. And so you, you get a maximum uh, away from zero. But you know, you can multiply it by a lot of things to get a uh, uh, non-zero estimate. But the important thing is you must get the same kind of property that you get in Remel or ML. So that's, uh, so it's not just multiplying by something uh, or add by something to get, you know, positive estimate. You have to also look at that thing. So in the paper by uh, my former student, Hugh Lin Lee and it appeared in a journal of multivariate. The factor that we chose, we take, it, it can be profile likelihood or Raymond likelihood, uh, it can get both. If the factor, which we call HLL, we took it as A, and that actually came from Morris uh, but, but his problem was different. He was trying to approximate the posterior distribution. So, we tried that, we thought fairly interesting there's a, we never proved that if you multiply it by A and consider maximizing the adjusted likelihood, you'll never get zero. Uh, the, it will be bounded away from zero. Plus, it will get the consistency property and we were able to study the bias of the estimate and so on. Okay, so uh, as a result, what will happen? The shrinkage factor, you remember di. If you if you use Remel, it may be zero, and so you have a um, over shrinkage problem. And if you use this kind of adjusted maximum likelihood, uh, it will be always between zero and one. And so you are always going to give some weight to the direct estimate. Okay. Uh, now the one one thing happened because it is doing something artificial right so you would expect some bias okay uh the bias will show up in the first order term and the bias it turns out to be big o one over a okay where a is the number of small area which is not good because if you look at the bias of remen it is little o one over a so Raymond has less bias than uh, this kind of adjusted likelihood. You know, it, it, it's biased more like the ML bias. So, uh, so some people ask me that question after writing the paper, including John Rao, you know, they said, okay, your method is biased. They said, okay, so we have uh, Masai, a very good student, PhD student, so when she came to work with me, I said, okay, we need to fix this problem. Uh, can you find some adjustment factor, not uh, HLL equal to A, don't multiply by A, by something else, so that the bias would be similar to, the bias property would be similar to the Raymond. That's the best possible bias property that you can have. And uh, in a paper, again in JMDA, Journal of Multivariate Analysis, uh, she worked really hard to figure this out. So she used basically our pan property. If you look at the curve, you know what I mean. You multiply by that, and what will happen that 
it will be almost like your Riemann likelihood until it's very close to zero when it suddenly drops down. And so when it drops down, you know, it cannot get maximum value at that point, right? So it will be always staying out of the likelihood. So, so I mean, if you are interested, you can look at this paper uh, to see what we did. There are a lot of details there. And uh, one of the things that we got uh, properties that when you use this kind of specially device um, uh, adjustment factor uh, in terms of bias property it is equivalent to the linear but it will be strictly positive and so you you have shrinkage is always between zero to one okay okay now let's talk about mean square error Again, it's some people call it mean square prediction error, but I'm just calling it MNC of E plug. Well, as we have seen in Domingo stock and some of you, you know, uh, there is the G1, G2, G3, uh, famous three terms in uh, small area estimation. And so MAC, mean square error of love, is basically expected value of the squared difference between the love and the true value, right? And under the family model, we can have an explicit closed form formula. That's a nice thing. And that is G1 plus G2. So there are formula, but uh, I'm not stressing on the formula. I would just like to say that G1 term is what? G1 term is uh, capturing the variability of the best predictor. That means when you know both beta and both are known. So this is the measure of uncertainty of the base predictor okay when both are known okay and what about g2i g2i is you know in block beta is already estimated by weighted least square when a is known right so g2i is the uncertainty captured uh, due to the estimation of beta by the weighted least square estimation so when you, uh, when you don't know beta, it should have more variability, right? And that G2 is capturing that value. So that's one point. Second point I would like to say that the G1, that is uncertainty for a uh, base predictor is a dominating term, okay? And this G2 term is smaller usually in certain sense. And if you look at this expression that I have written there, uh, in one type of, in fact, the most common type of asymptotic framework, you assume DRs are uniformly bounded. The sampling variances are uniformly bounded. It's not going anywhere. And so the G1 term is of order big O1. You increase it, it won't go anywhere because, because of the assumption DRs are uniformly bounded. Okay, but G2 term, if you look at it, uh, it is of order big O, one over A. That means if you take M large, it will go to zero. Okay, so that's why we say that G1 is the dominating term and G2 is a term lower than that. No? And it is of order one over A. Okay, so this is fine. And then you might say, okay, I, uh, I don't have blob, I have E blob, right, or EB, where A is replaced by A hat, by some estimator of A, okay? And then the question is, what would be the mean square error estimate? Well, you can say, okay, I have the mean square estimator of blob, G1 plus G2, and I know that I, I have to estimate the mean square estimator, mean square error estimator of E blah. So I'm going to just take mean square uh, error of blah and just plug in the estimator of A, like G1 A hat plus G2 A hat. And that we call in small area estimation naive estimator of mean square error of E blah because there are a couple of things. One is uh, G1 plus D G2 will not capture the variability in estimating A, right? Because we are 
in E block, we are estimating A also. So if we use this G1 plus G, G2, it will not capture the variability uh, due to estimation of A. That's one thing. And secondly, the G1 term is kind of a special term. I uh, told you that it is order one, right? So although if you plug A hat in G2, it should be okay if you use a consistent estimator of A because the bias in estimating G2 would be little of one over N. But G2, G1, when you try to estimate by plugging in a hat in, uh, in G1, it will, it will have a bias expression, which will be order BO1, BO1 over N, not uh, small enough in small area situation. So there are two problems. So the, in order to so solve the first problem, let's see how to capture the additional variability in estimating A. So essentially, uh, what you need to do here, the mean square error of E blob, okay, mean square error of E blob, you can write as mean square error of blob plus expected value of this square difference between E blob and blob based on some theory they are in small area estimation or mixed model. There's a famous paper by Kappar and Harvey. They do that under certain condition, of course, under certain um, type of estimator of A and for all the estimators that I talked about so far, that satisfies this. Now, G3A is the term that captures the variability, additional variability due to estimation of A. And here again, uh, the order of G3 is the same as the order of G2, and both are order one over A. So it's only the G1 term uh, that, is a, uh, that is the dominating term, and that's order one, okay? So uh, there is some, uh, I think, typo here. So this is not, oh no, this is fine. So G1 plus G2 plus G3 plus uh, what it remains is of little o four one word. So we just ignore it. And so you might say, okay, why do you have to uh, take care of G3? Because you know, if you if you include a order one over a term due to estimation of beta, why not uh, do the same thing for estimating a hat as well? And this is again. One order one over n term. If it turns out that if it is lower than that, then we could have ignored it, right? But it's the same order. Okay. Uh, now, unfortunately, we cannot uh, use that G1 plus G2 plus G3A because A, the variance components are is unknown, right? So we cannot use that. So we have to do something. So we need to uh, get uh, the concept of second order unbiasedness. Basically, we need to get an estimator of MSC such that bias, that is expected value of the estimator of MSC and MSC is of little o, one over n order. Where again, m is the number of small areas. Okay, so that's the definition of second order unbiased MSC is often called nearly unbiased. Uh, MSC estimator. Okay, uh, a naive estimator uh, plugged a hat into the MSC of lab, as I, as I already told you, is not uh, doesn't satisfy this property. It's not second order uh, unbiased. In other words, if you, if you look at the bias, it's of order big O one over n. When I talk about bias, MSC is always referred to the periodic model. It's not designed this. Okay. Okay, so uh, this is what we have. So we have to do something. And uh, then the second order unbiased estimator of MSC, uh, we need to get, there are various methods available. Uh, there is a Taylor linearization method used in Prasad and Rao. Uh, and it depends on how you're estimating the parameter parameter. For Prasad and Rao used, uh, Anobatio method, method of method. And later on in a paper with uh, Gauri data in 2000, we extended it to cover maximum likelihood and ML. Uh, and there is the uh, paper by 
Das, Jiang, and Rao, which has further extended the model. And then in Lee Lahiri and Yosemite Lahiri, where you use the adjusted maximum likelihood estimator, of our, uh, we, we, we had those methods. So basically, uh, when you use ML uh, or adjusted ML or ML or uh, adjusted uh, ML, the, the, un, the estimator of MAC uh, that you get has this form, G1 A hat plus G2 A hat, there's a two coming in, G3 A hat, and some B of A hat that depends on the bias of A hat and uh, bi hat square. For example, if you use Prasadra, because Prasadra method of moment is approximately unbiased, right? Or the bias is of lower order than one over n. And so the last term drops, drops out because b of a hat is <laughs> or lower. Yeah. And uh, if you use remail, you don't have it. But if you use ML, you have b hat because the bias of ML is one over it. If you use my paper, uh, earlier paper with uh, Masayo, uh, it will be also there because, uh, 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 sorry, my paper with Lee, uh, the bias is of order one over N, so it will be there, right? So it depends on which method of uh, estimation you use for estimation of the parameter A. Now, you also see two, right? Why this is coming? Because, you know, the G1, G2 term and G3 term, if you plug in a consistent estimator of A, then the bias of these two terms uh, would be negative. They can ignore it. But we cannot do the same thing for G1, because G1 is of order one, right? And so we need to make correction. And when you do bias correction, there is another G3 coming in. And so after uh, bias correction, you get this two, right? And so, uh, as I said, for Remel or uh, the Remel where we use adjusted residual likelihood, the form is similar, G1 plus G2 plus 2 G3, okay? Now, there is a jackknife method. I'm not going to talk about that. Uh, that uh, is 2002 analysis of statistics paper with uh, my friend Jiming Jiang and my former student. Uh, this method uh, has well been also proposed. Okay, now there is a lot of interest these days on parametric bootstrap method, and this has got a history actually. Uh, in the nine, mid 90s, I had a student, Ferry Butar Butar, was trying to write a thesis, uh, and um, he was interested in small area estimation. Okay, and at that time, we saw a paper by uh, Laird and Lewis, 87 paper in JASA, and they are doing empirical base, and they, they, they proposed a parametric bootstrap for empirical base, but they were using parametric base, parametric uh, bootstrap to mimic hyperparameter Bayesian calculation, not the MAC that we do, right? And as a result, their method is not second order um, unbiased that small area people like. And so Butter, Ferry Butter wrote uh, his thesis and he proposed uh, a parametric bootstrap method, I believe for the first time in small area literature, where uh, he considered linear mixed model, uh, I mean, it includes Fahrenheit model and uh, necessary model, but other models. And there, he proposed everything in a computational way, uh, uh, both the uh, the approximation part of it and also the bias correction part of it. So that this appeared finally in uh, 2003 JSPI paper. And uh, that was the first time used in small area context, and there are some other paper around the same time. Uh, there is a paper by Pfeffer, uh, he proposed something, and then you know 
now it's very popular. I, I know that World Bank they like parametric bootstrap because they they use very complicated models. You know, uh, otherwise they have to find G1, G2, etc. And they just do their computation on the way. Now, before leaving this thing, I would like to say something about why second order unbiasedness is important. Why not just talk here? You know, well, who cares about little or big group, right? Now, uh, in my paper with Jimmy Jam appeared in test, uh, Spanish Jam, right? And uh, you wrote a, a discussion there. And there was an, one discussion written by Carl Morris also. He doesn't like asymptotic that much. You know? <laughs> and our paper was all asymptotic. Thing. And it said uh, nothing goes to infinity. Everything is finite. And if you read uh, Efron and Morris paper, Thema's paper, they're always like uh, m equal to 18, 9, and things like that, right? <laughs> Not like m equal to thousands. And so he, he questioned uh, our approach, you know. M is never very large. So at first I didn't understand what he was talking about, but then I realized that what he meant actually, uh, if, you, if you take M very large, the basic assumption of exchangeability is violated. Exchangeability in the sense that uh, the variance uh, components are all the same, the regression parameters are all the same for our area. You won't believe it, right? If you have like 3,000 small area, you don't want to believe that the regression coefficient will be the same. You see there will be some difference, right? And so if, if M is very large, there is no good thing point in going for big or small, doesn't make sense. You know? but, the, but, but the fact is that in small area estimation, we have to be careful about the modeling. And if you are careful about the modeling, you worry about exchanging. You don't want to you know, fool thousands of small area. Uh, most likely you will form some group and within the group, you will use whatever small area model uh, you, are, you like, whether area level or unit level, right? And so in, in reality, aim is not big, but in an asymptotic frame, framework, we have to talk about big or small, right? And and so uh, if if aim is not small, then the bias, bias is a, a big or term, that makes sense, and we have to correct for that. And so I feel that gave uh, us a motivation to write the paper that uh, appeared in GRSSB with Nicola and Nicola. So that was the main thing. So we had a flexible model, but in a classical framework that allows us to take in very large. So we just ignore the bias correction. Well, I'm talking too much. Please stop me. You know? <laughs> so is it and until now you have been talking for? 55 minutes. Okay, I think I should not talk much, you know. Uh, so let's see. Um, so I should go into some details here. Uh, so here, one thing I would like to say in uh, small area estimation is not just theta i, but also of interest is the estimation of bi, the shinkai parameter, because a lot of times this gives you a sense of how good is the model. So somebody will say, what is your b? Is it 0.1 or 0.9? So it's important to estimate the B, uh, B, not just the variance component D. So we we develop uh, uh, a method which will satisfy a number of things. First of all, uh, if we focus on B, right, BI, we'd like to be accurate in estimating on B so that we can use it. Now, no matter what estimator you use for A, regular estimator, right, ML, ML, etc., you plug it in, the order of the bias of BI would be always big O1, big O1 variable. So the first question is, can we get an estimate estimator where the shrinkage parameter is nearly accurate, you know, that is BI little O1, so that's one thing. Second condition is that this will be always between zero to one, and third condition, you don't like bias correction. It's a, a lot of work. So it, can we just use this G1 plus G2 plus G3 without bias correction, uh, that one? And then can we use the parametric 
bootstrap in a natural way. That means you get a bootstrap sample, you estimate the parameter, uh, you estimate the parameter, and you yes, uh, you get the uh, parameter and just take a bootstrap without any bothering about bias correction. So the question is, can we do all these things simultaneously? Well, there is a way to do it uh, under this uh, adjusted factor. And we found a factor which depends on the ith area and that satisfy all the properties. And uh, so this is this factor is discussed in um, my paper with Masai in analysis statistics. Basically, the contribution is can we find a adjustment factor HI such that you know we get good estimator of the shrinkage parameter, right? Shrinkage parameter will be always between zero to one, and then we don't need the bias correction for MSC. Like you can just use G1, G2 plus G3, right? And the third one is you do parametric bootstrap in a natural way as a from proposed long back back without bias correction. And so there is a, a factor like G1, and that factor, uh, I mean, we, we used uh, uh, some differential uh, equation to solve and we get this factor like A plus DI, and that works out very well. In fact, that's a unique factor. And since I ran out of time, uh, I, I just give the final result here, theoretical result. The first one, as I said, that the, uh, we can estimate the BI accurately. That means bias is of lower order, okay? And then uh, the estimate of BI is always between one and zero, and the bias is uh, little one over M. And you can do parametric bootstrap without the bias correction. So these are all theoretical results available. And we did some simulation work and real data analysis. Since I don't have time, you know, I can discuss in an informal way. Okay, okay. thank you. Any more questions? Well, I, I, I have some, some questions so, or comments. Uh, when, when in, in, the, in the initial in the initial slides, when uh, the adjusted method is is formulated, uh, the, this is formulated on the likelihood for the function, not in the log likelihood. When 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 this is programmed, uh, maybe you, you take logarithms. And then the factor that you put in, in, in the first case is a summary. Yeah, so if we if do in the log like you do it, uh, there's an extra term which is plus log of a. Yes, yeah. plus log of a. That's true. So the, the, so this this somehow is, is uh, or, or has a small relationship with uh, you know what we do when we do lasso or when we do rich regression that we penalize, but we are penalizing the, the beta, the beta coefficients. Well, what, what is nice here is that you obtain these uh, properties of, of consistency uh, of the of the estimator of the of the variance, and this is uh, this is uh, very nice. This is very nice. Because uh, you are forcing the, the, the estimator to be far from zero, and the first uh, things uh, someone thinks is yes, but if you do that, you are going to do, introduce a lot of bias. But it is intelligent how how you did it. So yeah, we have I to like think a lot. You know, the the BI the mm. factor is an important one from mm. practical consideration because depending on the values of BI. So if it, BI is close to one, that means your model is very good. The level two, you you have got a lot of good auxiliary variable, right? And a lot of people would like to know what what kind of BI you have. So the parameter BI itself is an important one, right? But then when you use any kind of standard method, you plug it in, and if you care about the bias, it is always big over one over n. Yeah. I mean, it goes to zero, but at the rate of one over n, right? We try, try to bring it down. So that's one thing. 
Second thing is that uh, we always want it to be between zero and one, strictly between zero and one, right? The other thing people worry about in this MSC estimation is the bias correction in MSC. This is kind of messy. And so we cannot use G1 A, A hat plus G2 A hat plus G3 A hat because there is a bias, big bias in character for G1, right? And then we have to do bias correction either in Taylor series method or jackknife method or parametric bootstrap method. And they are always messy, kind of unnatural, you know. And so we said, okay, we we will find a method of estimating of A that will automatically correct all the problems that we encounter. And uh, using this adjusted, uh, like I call it adjusted maximum likelihood, but likelihood can be, you know, uh, remain or compile likelihood. It turns out there is a solution, you know, uh, but this is strictly for fake idiot model univariate, right? So there are yes. scope for doing more work here, like right? a multivariate or some of the complicated models clear. that we have. I agree. I was all the time thinking how, how to translate this to bivariate five hundred model, which is not not yeah, simple, it, you know, it will come in terms of eigenvalues mm -hmm. and all this stuff. I do not know whether anybody has done it, but you know. Uh, maybe some Japanese or mm -hmm. uh, maybe collaborator or yes. but it could be an interesting problem. I think. Yes, it, it, it is true. It is true. And, and, and according to your experience in, in, in programming, uh, you know, the optimization of the uh, likelihood function with this factor, uh, and then if, if we use a, a method with first and second derivative, like say new neutral rational method, we still uh, have the problem that uh, uh, by by going and by running the, the, the algorithm could go out of the parameter space. Uh, I, I don't know if by introducing this outcome, um, it is a, a guarantee that starting from a C, you are always inside. I, I guess not. I guess not. Uh, the way we did it is yes. uh, yes. just one way, yes. right? You yes. maximize the yes. using a uh, very simple method. Mm. So for us, uh, there is no, no issue here. No, no issue because if, it, if, it, if, it, if, it, if there is a, 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 an issue, it's, it's a much lower size with uh, that without uh, introducing yeah. that, that, uh, that factor. Yeah, one thing I can say, theoretically, it cannot be. Mm. So we uh, the opting. Yeah. But I, I mean the, yeah. the, the steps in the steps of that yeah. algorithm, depending on, on the C, you you will arrive to the optimum, but if you go out of the parameter space, you have to stop yeah. because then the next step may, may be some a disaster. Yeah, yeah I think to ask yeah. Masai or mm -hmm. what uh, the, maybe in this simulation I'm checking yeah. if, if maybe once in a million. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, we never face this problem. Okay. Okay, thank so, okay. you. Uh, the question? Maria? Stefan? No? Well, and then they are going to say it for more than that. So, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>